Questions orales, oral, oral questions. questions. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, Liberal high tax hypocrisy is back. We all remember when the Finance Minister brought in massive new tax increases on small businesses, but exempted the Prime Minister's multi million dollar trust fund inheritance and his own billion dollar family business from any increases. We all remember when they raised taxes on the middle class by $800 a family, but collected less from the, from the uh, wealthiest 1%. Why is it with a carbon tax, it's once again more high tax hypocrisy from this Liberal government? Yeah. To stand up in this house and say there will no polluting will no longer be free. We know there's a cost to pollution. We are seeing extreme weather events across this country, from forest fires in British Columbia to droughts and uh, floods across the uh, prairies to people literally dying of extreme heat. We need to take action on climate change, and you know what we're going to do in a way that makes sense. The average fa a family of four in Ontario will receive $307 back to, for climate action incentive. That is more than they will pay. We have a plan to grow the economy. We have a plan to tackle environmental we have plans to cut. Order. I remind members that the time to speak is when they've been, organ when they've been recognized. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, here we go again, Mr. Speaker. They're, they have a separate deal for special interests that have powerful lobbyists. It says right here in their own background document, there will be a separate pricing system for industrial facilities. Hmm. They'll get a 90 per cent exemption from this Liberal carbon tax, while small businesses, soccer moms, and suburban commuters will have to pay the tax on 100 per cent of the energy they consume. Why is it that with this Liberal high-tax hypocrisy, those that, that emit the most pay the least? Here, here. Honourable Minister of Environment. Let's be perfectly clear, there is a cost to pollution and everyone will pay the price for pollution. That includes large industry. But you know what? On the other side, large industry will pay nothing because they don't believe there's a cost to pollution. They don't think they think polluting should be free. The system we're, fo we're following for trade exposed industry is the same followed in Quebec in British Columbia, in California, in Europe. It creates the incentive for industry to reduce emissions, uh, but to stay competitive and keep good jobs in Canada. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Yes, and in all those jurisdictions she just mentioned, the government wins and taxpayers lose. That has been the experience in every jurisdiction where there is a carbon tax. People pay more so government can spend more, and that is the case with this same plan. According to the government's own briefing documents, this government will collect more in taxes than it gives back in rebates, which means it's impossible for taxpayers to be made whole. Why are they targeting soccer moms, suburban commuters, and seniors with this high tax grab? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Environment. We understand that climate change is real. We understand that there's a cost right now, and Canadians are paying it. Unlike the party opposite, who think that polluting should be free, who have no plan to tackle pollution, we have a plan. But let's talk about what people are saying about our plan. The business, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada, we support the price mechanism because it provides the economic incentive for consumers to change their behaviour and for businesses to invest in technology that progressively reduce their emissions over time. Tracy Snowden from CD Howe. Carbon pricing continues to be the most co cost effective option for achieving emissions reductions across the country. Order. I'm not sure if the member, honorable member for Cypress Hills Grasslands, or if I said a minute ago, but I'd ask him to remember what I said a minute ago. And remember that members speak when they have the floor, not otherwise. The honorable member for Carleton. Well, there goes the minister quoting the lobbyists for the multi-millionaire CEOs. And of course they support this carbon tax. It's not a big expense for them when they have chauffeured limousines paid for by the company, especially if they're one of the companies that has the 90 per cent exemption that this Liberal government has provided to the large industrial corporations. The reality is that small businesses have no similar exemption. 
Why do small businesses like a local corner store pay more while large corporations with their well-paid CEOs get off? Here, here. The Minister of Environment. Also care about tackling climate change. They also care about the environment, and they understand the cost of inaction. We are supporting small businesses. We will be providing one million dollars through uh, our climate plan in Ontario that will help support small businesses to be more energy efficient, to save money. But let's talk about who else is talking about our plan. The Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. This is good news for human health and the planet. This is how we protect people from the harmful impacts of heat waves, droughts, wildfires, floods, hurricanes that are becoming more frequent and more intense. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Yesterday, the Prime Minister was asked nine times whether or not small businesses would get the same exemption as large industrial corporations do under this Liberal carbon tax. Nine times he refused to answer. We know that this will cost more in fuel and heating and transportation for those small businesses. They are the lifeblood of our economy, and they're already paying higher taxes as a result of the Prime Minister's tax increases. So, direct question. Will small businesses get the same exemption as the large industrial corporations? Yes or no? Honourable Minister of Environment. We have already said that there's going to be a price on pollution and everyone is going to pay the price on pollution, whether you're a big uh, industrial emitter or whether you're a small business. But we are also going to help small businesses save money because when you're more energy efficient, you actually save money. But let's talk about Stephen Harper's former director of policy. We think that the federal government is doing the right thing in putting a price on carbon in these provinces, that they have done so and are returning money directly to households. This will encourage lower emissions while ensure also ensuring that Canadian Families will not be negatively affected. The member for Rimouski Nejet Timiskwata Les Basques. CBC, the Prime Minister said, quote, I don't want to leave Canadians holding a billion dollar bill. But yesterday, the Prime Minister's office backtracked on that number and said the supposed one billion dollar penalty for cancelling the Saudi arms deal was. An expression. I'm not kidding you, Mr. Speaker. He said it was an expression. Whoa. Canadians know this deal must be cancelled, and I have a right to know why the Prime Minister is using this as an excuse. Why is the Prime Minister making up numbers? Is it so that he doesn't have to cancel the arms deal with Saudi Arabia? Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, of course, we strongly demand and expect the Canadian arm, that Canadian arms exports are used in a way that fully respects human rights. That's why our government is committed to a stronger and more rigorous arms export system uh, under the Arms Trade Treaty. As the Prime Minister said today, yesterday, we are actively reviewing existing export permits to Saudi Arabia. The member for Rimouski, Nejet, Timuskwata, Les Basques. That's all they have to say. Um, they're not even listening to Germany or allies to suspend the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia. Tuesday, the Prime Minister said that cancelling the contract would cost a billion dollars. Where did It seems he's pulled that number out of his hat because the next day his office said that it was just an expression. Um, an expression um, is a, a colorful mix of words, but it's but it's he's not answering the question. So why is he inventing numbers? Is it so he does not have to cancel the contract? The Minister of Transport, as I said in English, Mr. Speaker, we insist that Canadian arms exports are used in a way that respect human rights, and that's why our government has committed to put in place a system of arms exports which is stronger and more rigorous. Another prime minister said today, we are actively looking at export permits, the current ones with Saudi Arabia. The member for Laurier Saint Marie. In Germany, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi was the tipping point. Chancellor Angela Merkel decided to export exporting weapons to Saudi Arabia because it was the right 
thing to do. We have been calling for years for the Canadian government to do the same. Everyone knows the Kingdom is one of the worst human rights offenders in the world. This alone should be enough. What are the Liberals waiting for? Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, our government is working with our allies to consider a number of options going forward. We are actively reviewing existing export permits to Saudi Arabia. We strongly expect that Canadians' exports are used in a way that is consistent with Canada's foreign policy objectives and that fully respects human rights. We have frozen arms export permits before when we have had concerns about their potential misuse, and we will not hesitate to do so again. The member for Laurier St. Marie. Mr. Speaker, Riyadh's explanations about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi are inconsistent and contradictory. For the first time today, the Attorney General of Saudi Arabia said it was a premeditated act after the way women, dissidents, and minorities, religious minorities, are treated not to mention the war in Yemen, this is the last straw. For years, we have been asking for the government to act. When will we finally stop selling weapons to Saudi Arabia? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, as I res said in English, we are looking at the current situation. We are currently looking at our contract with Saudi Arabia. In the past, we have frozen exports when we felt the weapons would be used against human rights. And we will not hesitate to do the same thing in future if we are convinced that these weapons will be used to violate human rights. Well, the Prime Minister's carbon tax will cost the average Canadian family way more than the Liberals are letting on. As gas and electricity prices rise, small businesses will have to increase their prices to pay their bills, making it even more difficult to survive. This is not just a tax on carbon, it's a tax on everything. Gasoline, home heating, groceries, transportation, and this tax does nothing to reduce emissions. That's the problem. With Halloween just around the corner, will the Minister now agree that her carbon tax swindle is a trick, not a treat? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, from Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, you need a price on carbon and you need a price on pollution. Canada, as of today, has both. It unlocks investment decisions which will make for more low carbon economies. Del Bugan, he's the Executive Director of Eco Fiscal Commission. Bigger households get bigger checks, and most, ha and most households will see rebates that are larger than their carbon pricing costs. Households will see net gains. The Fondation David Suzuki, La Tarification. The, for the David Suzuki Foundation, carbon pricing is necessary to effectively fight. Order. Order. Most members in all parties are able to sit through a question period and hear lots of things they don't like without interrupting or feeling they have to react before it's their turn. I'd ask members to show a little respect for this place. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal carbon tax will have a direct price on everything Canadians will have to buy, but obviously the Liberals uh, embrace principles like polluters needing to pay, but the problem is that polluters won't pay the same as smaller people, such as um, small businesses. But large polluters will get uh, a discount of 90 percent. Uh, why are there two standards? Well, it's surprising that the opposite member is opposed to what everyone is doing in Quebec. Uh, they believe in climate change. They want to do something about it. They want to put a price on pollution. They know that pollution is not free. But the, the question is, what is the plan for the Conservatives? They have no plan. They want pollution to be free. They don't want to do anything about climate change, but Canadians are paying the price for that right now. Canadians want a plan. For Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what the Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association is saying. 
Beef producers will have to absorb the cost of this liberal carbon tax. They export their products and must compete on international pricing. The impact of the Prime Minister's carbon tax will cut into ranchers' bottom lines, and these additional costs will eat into the livelihoods of hard-working farm families. Why is the Prime Minister so set on punishing beef producers with higher costs for inputs, such as feed and animal transportation? Honourable Minister of Environment. Farmers understand the impacts of climate change. Droughts and floods are having severe impacts, and we know in the future that will continue to happen. That's why we are working with farmers. Our plan exempts farm fuels, diesels, used for on-farm use. We are also supporting... Order. I've heard an awful lot already today from the honourable members for Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa, and Huron, Bruce, and I'd rather they wait till they have the floor, obviously, as is required by the standing orders. The honourable minister of environment has the floor. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work with farmers. We will continue to work with small businesses. We will continue with cities. We will work it with everyone because we know that climate change has a real cost right now, and we owe it to Canadians. We owe it to the next generation to take serious action while making life more affordable for Canadians. We can do both, but what is the Conservative plan? A member for Prince Albert. Mr. Speaker, farmers are upset that this government has brought on another tax that their international competitors don't have. Right. And while the member from Wascana says they'll be exempt, the reality is the cost on fertilizer, fuel, parts and transportation will increase due to the carbon tax. The reality is they're being taxed and deceived by this Liberal government. Why won't the Minister or the Liberal government admit this is not an environmental plan but just another tax? Well, Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, why don't the Conservatives admit that climate change is real, that there's a cost that Canadians are paying right now, that it shouldn't be free to pollute, and that Canadians deserve to see a plan? If they have a plan, they should make it transparent. Show us how they are going to do what they voted for. Conservatives voted to for the Paris Agreement. They voted to support our international obligations, but we have seen nothing. They have no plan for the environment. They have no plan uh, for the economy. The Honourable Member for Cypress Hills Grassland. Mr. Speaker, when agricultural manufacturers like Honey Bee Manufacturing in my own hometown keep their companies in rural areas, they face extra cost to be there, especially around transportation. These plants are the heart of our communities. They allow young families and local businesses to prosper. The Liberals are dumping a tax on them that raises the price of everything, of fuel, transportation, heating and groceries. The cost of the Liberals' carbon tax will be the death of these small rural communities. Will the Prime Minister finally give small companies like Honey Bee the same exemption he's giving to large corporate emitters? report from the United Nations a couple of weeks ago. And you know what it talked about? It talked about the cost of inaction on climate change in the trillions of dollars. Canadians across the country are paying the cost right now. If you live in Saskatchewan or Manitoba, extreme floods, droughts. If you live Ontario, Quebec, you know, we've had extreme heat that has literally killed people. Forest fires in BC. Climate change is real. We need to take action. We need to do it in a way that makes life affordable, that grows the economy. We are doing both. The Conservatives have no plan. I'd ask the member for Yorkton Melville not to be interrupted when she hasn't got the floor. She's not been recognized. The Order. The honourable member for Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, the Prime Minister's new carbon tax that they're calling a plan is nothing more than a complicated shell game. But their games aren't just affecting employers like More Packaging and Barry, it's affecting the 300 employees and their families that will be hit with this tax. The Liberals are telling these people when they take their money, somehow they will get more back. But we know this is nothing more than a new way to pay for reckless spending. So when will the Liberals admit that this tax is a tax? Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting that the member on the opposite side was the same member that supported Patrick Brown, and Patrick Brown supported putting a price on pollution. Yeah, yeah. Let's be clear. We know that we need to take action on climate change. We need to make life more affordable. We are giving families more money that they will pay. Order.
It applies to both sides. Order. 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 I do, I do like seeing the smiles. That's good. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think it pretty much stands there that uh, the, the member opposite will flip flop depending on the issue. But we can't flip flop on climate change. We have to be serious. We have a plan to tackle the climate change for our economy. Order. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Freedom, equality, justice and peace are Canadian values. Mr. Speaker, we have a deal with the Saudis that enables them to wage war, silence dissidents and harm innocent civilians. A deal signed by Conservatives and upheld by Liberals. Canadians do not want to be complicit with the Saudi Arabian war crimes. This government has a responsibility to fundamental human rights and an absolute obligation to stand up for Canadian workers. What is the Liberal plan for protecting workers and their families in light of this mess? Mr. Speaker, we strongly condemn the horrible murder of Jamal Khashoggi and are deeply concerned by reports on the participation of Saudi officials. We strongly demand and expect that Canadian arms exports are used in a way that fully respects human rights. That's why our government is committed to a stronger and more rigorous arms export system and to the Arms Trade Treaty, which contrasts completely with the members opposite. As the Prime Minister said today, we are actively reviewing existing export permits to Saudi Arabia. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Batterie. Human rights seriously. Our member is an experienced members, member and he knows that he must direct his comments to the chair. And when you say you or your, you're referring to the speaker. I don't think he meant to, to refer to the, uh, to the chair. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Batterie. It seems that for a relationship to work, it takes someone who's deaf and someone who's blind. So the Liberal Conservative Pipeline Coalition partners must be crazy in love. On the one hand, you've got a prime minister who's deaf as he refuses to hear the warnings of, I, of the IPCC. On the other, you've got a leader who is blind as he refuses to see that our future is at stake. One promises to bring back Energy East, the other opens the door to that possibility. No one seems to believe in the protecting the environment, so will the Prime Minister promise never to bring back Energy East? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I was so pleased to be with the Prime Minister to announce that uh, Pollution would not be free in Canada anymore. We stand with Quebecers who know that we must fight climate change. We must price pollution and we must grow our economy at the same time. So we will keep on working together with them. I was very pleased to receive a call today from my counterpart in Quebec and we will and we talked about how we are going to keep on working together to fight climate change and create good jobs for Quebecers. Mr. Speaker, on Monday I asked the Minister of Defence what day James Cudmore was offered a job in his office. He told me he would get back to me. His office called mine the next day and told me what day James Cudmore started in his office. That wasn't the question that I asked, so I'm going to ask it again. I know now that he does know the answer, and I know that he can speak about it because he already has. So on what day was former CBC reporter offered a job as the Director of Policy in the Minister of Defence's office? The Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Honourable Member once again is uh, pursuing uh, a line of questioning that relates very directly to uh, a matter that's outstanding before the courts. Uh, as has been explained uh, repeatedly in this House, when there is a matter such as that, which is sub judici, uh, it is not only uh, inappropriate for ministers to respond but it's indeed inappropriate for the question to be placed that could impinge upon an outstanding court proceeding. 
Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, it's that government that has said that James Cudmore's hiring is related to Mark Admiral's court case, yep. and it is that Minister of Defence who's already spoken about this. Now, on November 20th, Cudmore was a CBC reporter writing about ship shipbuilding contracts, and by January 12, 2016, he was a Liberal employee working for the Liberal Minister of Defence. He didn't just get there on January 12th by accident. He was offered the job prior to that date. The Minister knows the answer. He's already spoken about it. So will the Minister of Defence keep his word to me and tell me what day Mr. James Cudmore was offered a job? Mr. Speaker, uh, legal proceedings are conducted in courts of law. In the particular case referred to, uh, the prosecution is very ably represented by the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. The Defence Council is obviously very adroit and very accomplished professional. Uh, they have the rules of court, they have the laws of evidence, uh, they have the normal procedures to follow, and it is in a court of law, Mr. Speaker, not on the floor of the House of Commons, that these matters should be prosecuted. I would note that the honourable members opposite do not have any mandate from either side in the issue to raise the issue here. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins Lévis. We would, like, we would like to know when Mr. James Cudmore was hired. We know that uh, he'd been working there as of January 12. But again, as for the exact hiring date, there's no answer. What do Liberals have to hide, Mr. Speaker? Um, there are workers from uh, the Levy shipyard who wants to know there is no money for the Levy shipyard and a lot of money for other shipyards in Canada. What are Liberals hiding? Honourable gentleman is a uh, very good friend of the uh, much beloved Peter Van Loan. And uh, Mr. Van Loan would advise him uh, in the very words that he used in this House, quote, it is deemed improper for a member in posing a question or a minister in responding to a question to comment on any matter that is sub judici. Those are the words of Peter Van Loan on the 11th of May 2015, and they apply equally well today. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins Lévis. Mr. Speaker, you know what Peter Van Loan would say today? He would say that it's a scandal that the Liberals are hiding answers. They're hiding because they don't want to explain why the Davy Shipyard is not getting contracts, yet Irving is getting contracts. The biggest contract uh, shipyard in Quebec is getting nothing. So what are the Liberals hiding? The auto member for Les Etchemins Belchasse Lévis is an experienced member of Parliament, and he knows that he must address his questions to the chair. So when he says you, he means the chair. So I hope he did not, uh, he, I hope he realized this. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, not only did uh, uh, former Minister Van Loan uh, cite that particular rule on the occasion that I referred to on the 11th of May 2015, but in fact, the sub judici principle was, was raised in this House by the former Conservative government, not once, not twice, but over 300 times when they were serving as the Government of Canada, and it was probably viewed rather favourably by the Speaker of the day. Excuse me. I'm told that the Honorable Member for Béchasse, Les Etchemins Lévis, quoted someone else when he said you, and so I apologize if that was the case. Uh, the Honorable Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, uniformed journalists and media workers are in Ottawa this week with a clear message. Liberals in action is why newspapers and media outlets are closing and why journalists are losing their jobs. What do Canadian media workers want? Stop giving tax deductions for ad buys on Facebook and Google. End the free rides for Netflix, Apple and Spotify and make them support Canadian content. 
force those who profit from the system to contribute to the system. We've been saying this to the Liberals for three years. We can't wait any longer. What will it take for this government to act now? Let's go. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, on the issue of taxation, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance have been entirely clear. But we also know that the Broadcasting Act hasn't been reviewed since before the internet was in our homes. The Conservatives did nothing for 10 long years, so we took action. We've appointed a panel of experts to help us modernize this Act. Our starting point is clear. All players that participate in the system must contribute to the system, and there will be no free rides. It's not going to be a free ride in five years, yeah. Fourteen former presidents of the Quebec Recording, Performance and Video Industry Association sent a clear message. Our music industry is in crisis. Quebec's artists keep creating, but the platforms fall outside our laws. For three years, we've been asking for Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Netflix, Google, whatever, to respect our culture and contribute to it. ADISC said that it's going to take political courage, but for three years, the Liberals have been looking for it for their courage. Can the minister answer us with something other than the same old tape his predecessor played for us? Come on. Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage. Speaker, we will always support our culture, our artists, and our creators, and that's why we doubled funding to the Canada Council for the Arts. We increased telefunding, uh, telefilm funding by $22 million and $13.5 million for the National Film Board. We restored and increased funding to CBC Radio Canada with a $675 million investment, and we also launched a new $125 million Creative Industries Export Fund. After the Harper Conservatives gutted support to cultural industries during their last decade, we have taken action to support this sector. Mr. Speaker, in September, the government released a report. The economy is strong and growing, and that by this time, this, this time next year, the typical middle class Canadian family will be $2,000 better off as a result of our plan. Néanmoins, Monsieur le Président. Nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, there's still work to be done to make sure that this growth stays on the right track to ensure that it benefits our hardworking families. Could the Minister of Finance update us on the Canadian economy and the next steps the government intends to, st to take? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Since 2015, we have kept our promise to Canadians to invest in the middle class to grow our economy. We today, our economy is among the strongest in the G7. Our unemployment rates are at near 40-year lows, and Canadians have created more than half a million new jobs in the last three years. So I'm pleased to say that on November 21st, we'll introduce our fall economic statement so we can update Canadians on further actions we'll take to keep our economy growing, to keep people investing in our country and creating jobs. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government is refusing to turn over the evidence for the court case of Vice Admiral Mark Norman. They're refusing to answer the simple questions. Who are they trying to protect and what are they, what are they hiding? So, Mr. Speaker, why are the Liberals refusing to turn over the documents? Have they already destroyed all the evidence? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, such an ass assertion is absolutely absurd. The, ma the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, there are legal procedures and processes that we have established in this country uh, under our court system to pursue uh, prosecutions and the defences of prosecutions. Uh, that is the forum in which these matters are dealt with. Uh, and in the House of Commons, uh, while the uh, debate can get hot and furious at times, the fact of the matter is matters that are sub judici must be left to the courts to deal with. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if the Minister could hear my question over all the noise of the paper shredding machines up in the Prime Minister's <laughs> office right now. Now, if this government has nothing to hide, why are they refusing to answer the questions? We're not asking them to comment on the court case. We're asking them to turn over the evidence that a serving Vice Admiral can use to defend himself. So why the cover-up? Have they already destroyed the evidence? Or are you trying to protect someone? Or are they trying to protect someone, Mr. Speaker? Yeah, that too. Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Gentleman uh, has an allegation of, uh, of wrongdoing or uh, of, uh, of criminal behaviour, uh, he should, in fact, uh, uh, provide that information to the RCMP. He should also have the courage to make the allegation outside this house. Yeah. 
L'honorable député. Alors. Order. Alors. Order. The Honorable Member for Shikutsumi Le Fial. Mr. Speaker, Vice Admiral Norman is an, a man of honor. He is credible. He did his best for the Royal Canadian Navy. He needs evidence to defend himself. The government is clearly hiding an extremely embarrassing situation. If the government wanted journalist James Cudmore to keep quiet, could other actions have been taken? Can the government assure us that no evidence was destroyed to hide their real political motives? Mr. Public Safety. Again, I advise the honorable gentleman that his allegation is absurd. Honorable member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the number of illegal crossings at the border is going up every day. Our border officers think that there is a wave of Salvadorian asylum seekers coming next sep September, as 200,000 nationals from El Salvador in the U.S. will have their special status revoked. Worse yet, the system is already broken and the minister has no plan. The prime minister must decide if he will let the entire world keep making a mockery of our borders or if he has the courage to uphold and enforce Canadian laws. When will he deal with the situation of the Safe Third Country Agreement? Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by simply saying that, that the member opposite's assertion that the numbers are going up is simply wrong. We've seen a significant reduction of those numbers uh, just over the past few weeks. In the, in the past several months, we've seen as much as a 70 percent reduction over what we experienced last year. Mr. Speaker, there was a firm plan in place to deal with this issue, and we are monitoring the situation in other countries, including the United States, very carefully. Mr. Speaker, our senior officials are working hard, they are prepared, and they're managing this situation quite ably. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Canadians from coast to coast support my bill to expunge criminal records for now legal cannabis possession, and editorials in magazines and newspapers across the country prove it. Everyone knows the government's pardon proposal just won't fix the problem. A pardon for a pot conviction won't help when you fill out a rental form or a job application, but expungement means you may truthfully say, I've never been convicted of a criminal offence. A pardon won't do that. Will the government work with me to erase these records and let these thousands of Canadians get on with their lives? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, we are always uh, very happy to uh, work with members of the opposition in, uh, in constructive uh, legislative endeavours. Uh, but I would also invite the honourable gentleman uh, to look at the other side of the question as well. And he will find that uh, a pardon can be a very effective tool. It is cheaper. It is faster. There is no fee. There is no wait time. The record is sealed and segregated. It can be reopened only in extraordinary circumstances, such as reoffending and committing another offence. And the effect of a pardon is protected by the Canadian Human Rights Act. The Honourable Member of saint hyacinthe Bagot. Mr. Speaker, in the Champlain Bridge file, I understand that you can't make asphalt in winter. But taxpayers have been waiting for years, and they'll have to keep being patient. The Minister has told us that these delays are excusable. But what these delays really show us is that public-private partnerships, PPPs, are not truly more efficient. Speaking of the private sector, will the Liberals make sure to go and get every last penny owed to us through fines for late delivery? How much more is this going to cost us, these excusable delays? Mr. Speaker, we are going forward with delivering on a new toll-free bridge. We are going to ensure the health and safety of workers on site and those who are going to use the bridge. I wish to reassure the people of Montreal that the Champlain Bridge is safe and that we are taking every step necessary to make sure that it will continue to be so. We will open a bridge to traffic by June 2019 at the latest. Alberta, Lakes, Brock. 
Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has told Canadians more than once that he plans to phase out the energy sector, and Bill C-69 is exactly yeah, how he will do it. The No More Pipelines Bill means more regulations and longer application times. It means reduced transparency, less investment. It means increased uncertainty and further job losses. The hundreds and thousands of Canadian families and the workers in the energy sector depend on the resource sector. They're calling it the final nail in the coffin. When will this government kill the No More Pipelines Bill and save the Canadian resource sector? the importance of the resource sectors to Canada's economy. We also understand that to get resources to the market, that Canadians need to have trust in the system. We have worked very hard at to develop a bill with businesses, with listening to the resource sector, listening to environmentalists, listening to Indigenous peoples, to bring together people together around a bill that will not only reduce timelines, will not only ensure that we're making decisions on good science, it will ensure that good projects go ahead. But we need to make sure that we are real rebuilding trust, we need to make sure we're listening to Indigenous peoples, and we need to ensure that we're making decisions. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. Mr. Speaker, in Calgary, Alberta, there is no trust for this government. Yeah, yeah. Bill C-69 is the greatest threat to Canada's energy industry since the NEP. The energy industry is responsible for more than 500,000 jobs across Canada. However, thanks to the Prime Minister's No More Pipelines Bill, there will be no more major energy infrastructure projects built in Canada. Kill it. Companies say that if the bill passes, they will stop investing in Canada. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister stop driving energy investment away and killing Canadian jobs? Yeah. The Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to protecting the interests of the energy sector and those work, people who work in the energy sector, we take no lesson from Harper Conservatives because they fail to diversify our non-US global market. And they failed to build a single pipeline in the 10 years to get our resources to non-US markets. We are working hard, and we will continue to work hard to ensure that our resources get to the global market. Honorable member for Edmonton Riverbend. Four pipelines, Mr. Speaker. That's what this government did, unlike those guys on that side of the house. Bill C-69, the carbon tax, the tanker traffic bans, all unmistakable signs of a government that is hostile to the future growth of the energy sector. There is no doubt that the No More Pipelines Bill, Bill C-69, is a direct attack on Albertans. The provincial NDP and the Prime Minister have punished hardworking Albertans enough. When will the Natural Resources Minister, who's from Edmonton, finally intervene and kill the bill. Mr. Speaker, when the, the Harper Conservative formed government in 2006, 99% of Alberta's oil was shipped to the United States. And when they got kicked out of the office in 2015, 99% of Alberta's oil was still shipped to the United States. That is their failed decade of a decade of inaction on protecting Alberta's interest. We are working hard to ensure that we get it right to build the pipelines by looking after the environment, at the same time making sure that we are consulting with indigenous communities in a meaningful way. That is the right path forward. Deputy de Pontiac. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The tornadoes that recently hit the National Capital Region, including my riding of Pontiac, caused over $295 million in insured damage to houses, businesses, and vehicles. The Insurance Bureau of Canada confirmed it, and I quote, that extreme weather events throughout Canada continue to show the financial costs of climate change for consumers and taxpayers. Clearly, the costs of climate change are being paid by every Canadian man and woman through higher insurance costs. Can the Minister of the Environment inform this House of how our government will not abandon Canadian taxpayers? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. I wish to thank the member of Pontiac for his question and for everything he has done to protect the environment and to tackle climate change. Canadians know that pollution isn't free. We're seeing the effects and the impacts all throughout the country, including in Pontiac. We, 
have a plan to put a price on what we don't want, which is pollution. We want cleaner air. We want fewer emissions. We want a planet that is healthy for our children and grandchildren. The Conservative Party has no plan. We will continue. For Okanagan, some milk mean Nicola. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve to feel safe and secure when they use their smartphones. However, this government has refused to ban communist Chinese government-built technology from our 5G network. Now, the 5G rollout will bring faster speeds, but it will also bring less security unless the government listens to our allies and bans Huawei. Mr. Speaker, when will this government say no way to Huawei? Mr. Speaker, our government is open to global investment because that creates uh, uh, middle-class jobs that helps grow our economy. When it comes to telecommunications, Mr. Speaker, we know that Canadians would like to see improvements in coverage and price, and we're committed to that. The 5G network is an emerging technology that has the potential to meet the explosion in consumer and industrial demand. And, Mr. Speaker, as regards the participation of any participant in our 5G networks, we will listen to the advice of our national security advisors. We will never, ever compromise our national security, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Government and its information should be open by default. Those were the Prime Minister's exact words in his mandate letter to the Minister of Heritage. Secret closed door consultations on an anti racism plan leaves Canadians and organizations working every day to combat systemic racism in the dark. The Minister should know by now about the value of openness and public accountability. After all, thanks to question period, he learned that systemic racism actually does exist in Canada. Will the Minister do the right thing and open up the process? Mr. Speaker, Canada is an open and diverse country, but there are still real challenges for many people in this country. Throughout our history and even today, there are many people and communities who experience systemic racism, oppression and discrimination, preventing them from fully participating in our society. These experiences are still felt by many Canadians, and now we can and must do better. That's why we're engaging communities across the country and people with lived experiences to modernize our approach and to develop concrete solutions on these problems. That's why we are undertaking these consultations. And as we speak right now, our Minister of Heritage is in one of those sessions. Honourable Member for York Centre. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month, the government's the government announced that it was maintaining its financial contributions to UNRWA over the next two years. This organization has been beset by issues of neutrality with respect to its educational programs in the West Bank and Gaza, which is deeply concerning to many of my constituents in York Centre and many others who have contacted me. Can the Minister of International Development update the House on the status of this contribution and what steps the government is taking to ensure UNRWA's neutrality and accountability? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our funding to UNRWA is vital to the humanitarian needs in the region, and it is the same amount we have provided over the last two years. UNRWA has refocused its neutrality-related activities like inspection and teacher training, which would not be done without Canada's re-engagement. In the West Bank, I met with the Palestinian Prime Minister and the Minister of Education and made our concerns clear about inappropriate content in PA textbook. Our commitment to neutrality and due diligence is an essential condition of Canada's support to UNRWA. The Honourable Member from Megantic Lerab. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister tried to justify why he gave up so much to the Americans with respect to supply management. He said that changes in access to markets were similar to those in the TPP. In other words, for the Prime Minister, we did it once, so we'll do it again. Wow, that's a great negotiator. The Prime Minister should know that concessions plus more concessions is twice as many concessions. The Liberals don't know how to count and don't know how to negotiate. Why are dairy, egg and poultry farmers always the ones paying twice over for his failure? Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Le President, and I can assure my honourable colleague, and I'm sure he's also fully aware, we're the party that implemented supply management, and we're the government that protected it. My honourable colleague is also aware that when the negotiations start, the, the American government indicated quite clearly they were going to end supply management. 
But, Mr. Speaker, we as a government protected it, and we understand that there's been an impact on our farmers, and we will make sure that they're fully and fairly compensated for their loss. We have and will continue to support our agricultural sector, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Deputy de Montcalm. The Honourable Member from Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, to talk through one's hat, that is an expression. To take someone for a fool, that is an expression. But a $1 billion bill to cancel an arm tra arms trade deal with Saudi Arabia, that is not an expression. Does the Prime Minister take us for fools? Or is he talking through his hat when he makes up numbers with respect to cancelling contracts with Saudi Arabia? Our government strongly condemns the horrible murder of Jamal Khashoggi and are deeply concerned by reports on the participation of Saudi officials. Our government is working with our allies to consider a number of options. We are actively reviewing existing export permits to Saudi Arabia. We strongly expect that Canadian exports are used in a way that are in line with our foreign affairs policy and, of course, fully respecting human rights. We have frozen export permits in the past when we had reason to do so, and we will certainly consider that in the future. The Honourable Member from Montcalm. The truth, Mr. Speaker, is that the Prime Minister wants to keep selling arms. A few cracks on the whip of Raif Badawi's back doesn't stop Canada from doing business. Neither does women being put in prison for defending their rights, nor does the death of civilians in Yemen, nor does the murder of a journalist in a consulate. What more does this government need? What more does it want to stop selling arms? To this heinous country. A bit of courage, maybe? Parliamentary Secretary. Our government strongly condemns the heinous murder of Jamal Khashoggi and are deeply concerned by reports on the participation of Saudi officials. We strongly demand and expect that Canadian arms exports are used in a way that fully respects human rights. That's why our government is committed to a stronger and more rigorous arms to export system and, of course, to the arms trade treaty of which we've been actively involved the entire time of the term of this government. As the Prime Minister said today, we are actively reviewing existing export permits to Saudi Arabia. Mr. Speaker, again, delays in the file for the Champlain Bridge. Opening the new bridge on December 21st, well, that just fell through. The Canadian government refuses to guarantee a date. Mr. Speaker, when we want to get a project done, we set a deadline. How is it that the Canadian government was able to set a deadline for legalizing pot onto Quebec, but can't guarantee a deadline for opening the Champlain Bridge? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We are going forward with delivering the new toll-free Champlain Bridge. We are proud to build a bridge that will last 125 years and will improve the quality of life of families in the Montreal region. This structure will be finished at the end of December, but some work, including paving, needs to be carried over to spring of next year. We're looking forward to opening the bridge to traffic in June 2019. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 83-1, I wish to table a notice of Ways and Means motion to implement certain provisions of the budget tabled in Parliament on February 27, 2018, and other measures. Pursuant to Standing Order 83-2, I ask that an order of the day be designated